Uh, I'm going to start off by asking the dumb question, can everybody hear me? All right. All right. By the way, they really did uh, warn everybody, there's apparently this button on this thing that if you push it, something catastrophic happens. I'm going to push it at the end of the talk, so <laughs> see what... Uh, um, we have a lot to cover, and I, I thought I would just start off, I've never really done this before, sort of kind of make a quasi-political statement, and it's really not political, but I just want to say one thing. Over the last couple of days, I've heard a lot of comments and rightfully so, we deserve it, about scientists and uh, the big mess that the world is in. But I'll tell you a quick story. When I was in high school and, and junior high, I used to hang around with all the weirdos. And the weirdos were the guys that you could go talk to out on the playground about Atlantis, and we read all those kind of books, and you know the Frank Edwards books on weird phenomena, UFOs. And then later on in high school, we kind of got into Primarily, it was various, you know, amine amide sort of compounds added onto lysergic acid and all that kind of stuff. And, <laughs> and, and, and I thought, wow, this is great. You know, there's this kind of really unique group of weird thinking people, very free thinking. And as I grew up, those guys all started to get like regular jobs and mortgages and, you know, and it was like, where's all the you know, the really strange guys. And I finally got a, I finally found the thing I love to do, which is physics. And, but all this time, there'd been for 15 years, 20 years, this kind of like, where are those, those free thinkers? And I was in the middle of a military installation and this guy came over and tapped me on the shoulder and he said, this, this guy wants to go to lunch with you alone and I can't mention the person's name. And, uh, but uh, Colonel Alexander took me to, uh, John Alexander took me to lunch, and I suddenly found, oh my God, these are where these guys are now. And all of a sudden, we were right back there on the playground, we were talking about, oh yeah, you heard about that shipboard experiment too, and all of that. So I will tell you that, you know, when Don Spencer had the idea for the high energy chemical laser, he said it knocked him to his knees, he had a vision. He had a vision of two worlds, one in which there was going to be a catastrophe between the Soviet Union and the United States, and another which might be avoided. And he literally said this dropped him to his knees. And what came through at that point, he said, was this strong prayer that was, he said, like felt himself enveloping the world that was, God bless this laser for the good of mankind. And you'll find many scientists at work in those communities actually are the more open-minded, the more willing to talk. I mean, this yoga talk where I work, they think it's great. I mean, they, they, everybody there, the president of the company is into like weird ancient civilizations and all that kind of stuff. It's if you go to the academic community, that you're going to find that, that those are the reincarnated priests from the Middle Ages, <laughs> all right? I've got a lot to go through, and I want to get to Angie's great new artwork. So look, um, basically, a lot of you have seen these charts, but Walter told me there'd be quite a few new people here. I'm going to talk about why it is that there is no time to give this talk. But the, uh, I have to also stand corrected. For the last two years, I've been saying, again, Goethe said, you know, and the, the story I'd been told was that Goethe was... Somebody came up and asked this completely impossible to answer quickly philosophical question, you know, about what's the meaning of Faust or something, you know, and he said, I have no time to be brief, and then proceeded to give it. Turns out, this is now what I've been told by some angry historians on the internet, it was actually Lord Nelson saying this to his mistress. <laughs> and it... takes on a totally different meaning. And so, basically, um, I, look, I, I, I have no doubt, uh, and also, if, for those of you that didn't hear this comment, uh, by the way, and the slide is staying on number one here, so, oh, I guess I need to advance this. I don't know anything about computers. I hate the things to tell you the truth. I, 
think this is a, a technology that'll soon be gone, by the way. I'm serious. It, this is, uh, if you know what's coming, the computer's a thing of the past. It's a ridiculous instrument. But basically, the, uh, the, 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 there are no doubt there are a lot of influences. And I do not question that there is going to be some type of profound uh, effects from things like impacts, uh, earthquake events. We also notice how we kind of leave another one of these things off of there, which is we don't always talk about, um, you know, we got long period comets and periodic increases in comet bombardment, you know, and all that. Yeah, all these things could be caused, but there's another thing that goes on this planet too. I'm not going to get too negative, but let's face it, there have been wars in the past. You all know the line from uh, Robert Oppenheimer when after uh, the bombs were used in Japan and physicists to this day carry that guilt, myself, every one of us, every one of us. Uh, I'll uh, sometime, uh, not here, but I'll tell you the story about the first time I met a survivor of Hiroshima. And it was even then, there was that energy of what my predecessors had done. But it happened. And uh, Oppenheimer was asked by the press, is this the first time, you know, meaning, did the Russians or, Ge or Germans get anywhere close? And he said, no, this is the first time nuclear weapons have been used in a very long time. And as you know, he was a student of the Vedic scriptures. So, um, and, you know, a lot of this stuff I'm going to just basically kind of go through. Uh, I also, by the way, will tell you if you want another really fantastic uh, flat-out description of the Yuga. This Kalevala epic, the more I'm reading about it, it is really right up there with the epic of Gilgamesh and the Ramayana and all. I mean, it is one of the world's great uh, traditions. This is from uh, uh, basically Finland. Uh, fantastic accounting of uh, the Golden Age, the Silver Age, and the quest for this thing that, that was responsible, responsible for those ages that we lost. And uh, in what I'm going to talk about is, okay, we've got a binary cycle. And the binary cycle, you know, that's, that's one thing, okay? That puts us into kind of a, uh, the idea that, okay, there's this orbit that the stars go through, but how exactly would that create the rise and fall of civilization, in addition to which there are wars and occasional cometary bombardments and earthquakes and tsunamis and all of that. So you got all that going on, but the cycle itself, why would a binary orbit actually cause an influence in consciousness? And so what was postulated, in fact, I'm going to stand back here so I can see the slide too, and then we'll use the laser to kind of point certain things out. Uh, basically, in that book, uh, The Holy Science, which was written by Sri Yukteswar, the uh, great Hindu Vedic sage, who really, really what the Holy Science was about was he took the just thousands and thousands of the Vedas and the Upanishads and the Shastras, and he cleaned it up and he put it into a simple text, and he basically just took it down to its core essence, because it was high time to do that. A lot of the you know, the, 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 the Hindus went through their own Kali Yuga too. I mean, the whole world did. And they went through the same thing where they just, you know, wrote and wrote and wrote the way they did in the Catholic monasteries and all these interpretations. And finally, he did, it was time for it to get simplified and made clear. And basically what he said is, look, this is caused by procession is actually a result of this orbit. During that orbit, we're getting closer to I initially in these charts said a third object. But very interesting. He doesn't say a third object. He says a center of rotation. And then as we move away from that, the center of rotation is a source of a powerful field. Now, he describes it as the universal magnetic field. Remember, that book was written in 1894. Okay. This is not a term that would have made any sense, but I think we do have a term that comes a little bit closer to it. Think unified field, the sum total, a field that is the sum total of all of the physical forces that we understand in nature, the underlying thing 
that basically gives rise to, if you will, breathes life into electromagnetic.